Happy Monday and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Rocketeer Minute where each and every day, Monday through Friday, we go over one minute of the greatest adventure movie Walt Disney's ever made, the 1991 Joe Johnston directed feature The Rocketeer. I'm one of your hosts, Jim O'Kane of TVDads.com. And I'm Hal Bryan, an airplane nerd from the Experimental Aircraft Association here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So Jim, as we kick off Minute 91, I can't believe that we've done more than an hour and a half of this film already. But uh, how cool is it uh, that you uh, you knew a guy? You brought yeah. us a guest. <laughs> we all know a guy, right? He's a friend yeah. of mine, um, Rory Aylward. Uh, Rory is uh, retired from the uh, Army Reserve. Has had uh, quite an interesting career there and deployed a couple of times in Afghanistan. And of course, first and foremost, we thank him for his service. Uh, but he's also uh, been working in films, uh, did some extra work, and uh, and then went on to uh, to form a, a group called Vets Military Advisors, where he shows up and and teaches your actors how to march and salute and and handle firearms without looking like morons and all those good things. So uh, Rory looks like you've worked on Tour of Duty, China Beach, uh, Heinlein's The Puppet Masters, Strange Days, all kinds of the Courage Under Fire, another one a bit more uh, more recently. And I love that in your bio uh, you mentioned uh, that you were actually deployed to a Nuristan province. The setting of one of my all-time favorite films, *The Man Who Would Be King*. So, Rory, uh, welcome to the Rocketeer Minute, and we'll uh, we'll talk even more about your connection to this film here shortly. Well, thanks very much. It's uh, it's great to be here. I, I had a fabulous time in the airport minute. I wasn't about to miss this. <laughs> well, we always, we're we always bring you in for the for the fiery climax here. So, uh, this <laughs> yes. is uh, this is some good stuff. And, and you're actually you get some screen time uh, in this particular one out there at uh, on a freezing cold night at, in front of the Griffith I, I Observatory. Did. I did. I, I spent, uh, I was probably about a week uh, in November of 1990 when they were shooting the, uh, the scene at the Griffith Observatory. And I played a, well, played is, is a grandiose way of, I showed up to be an FBI agent uh, working for uh, Ed Lauder. Uh, so it was, uh, <laughs> it, was it, it was quite an entertaining time. And I was already a, a Rocketeer fan by that point. So I was, I was willing to come on in any capacity. Uh, to be in the film. Wow. This is the, the big action piece here. So you got a lot of uh, booted out, booted out going on. And uh, it, it, re it really helped. I mean, you're, you're kind of toward the, the final couple of seconds in this, in this particular minute. But uh, good, uh, def definitely good uh, trigger protocol and uh, nice <laughs> stance. <is really. laughs> yes. I, I, I suspect Rocketeer was one of the uh, movies that led me to form my own technical advising company because... <laughs> When they started handing out Tommy guns, people were just, what's that? You know? like, oh, wow. <laughs> you just see the, the, the armor is just rolling his eyes going, please, God, don't let anything bad happen. To yeah. <laughs> so forgive a really, really basic and ignorant, ignorant question, but I mean, I, I, I know firearms okay, but I'm, I'm always curious in something like this. You have an armor who's on set. Right. And is he sourcing? Are these all original MP40s and Thompsons and we're just shooting blanks? Are these modified? Are these... These are, uh, what these, are, are these? these are original weapons that uh, had been converted to fire blanks. So okay. they basically have a, a, a barrel stop. Oh, sure. Um, because, uh, you know, so many of the weapons have a, a blowback. So there's, a, there's enough to allow the flame to come through. But then, you know, they're, they're modified in whatever way to make them safe to fire blanks. So it's got like a like a choke in the middle there. Is yeah, that, yeah. Okay. So it's. I mean, it depends. I mean, anything. For for instance, the uh, the 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 M sixteen is a gas operated weapon, so they have to modify those so that they still gets enough gas to blow, to push the uh, push the bolt back, but you still want the flame effect in the front. So yeah. But these weapons are all you have to have a a federal firearms license to handle them or to store them or anything. So it's very tightly controlled. But yeah, yeah. They're, they're real weapons. Even after they've been modified, you still need, what is that, the Class 3 license? Yeah, or Class 3 license, is? absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Cause, so because, you know, I mean, it, it in, in certain cases, they could be modified back. So, you know. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, the, 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 the mechanism still works. So potentially they're still dangerous, so. Uh, how, how many offhand? How many people were firing uh, weapons in this particular scene? Because to me, it always looks like there's like thirty guys, but I can't imagine this is that many that are that are uh, I, armed. I, I want to say they had fifteen or twenty Tommy guns. 
on the set. Oh. Uh, not all of them were practical. Um, on, on any set, a lot of weapons will be, um, they'll have the, the practical weapons that fire, and then they'll have like mock-ups, or they'll, or they'll have weapons that are real weapons, but they don't fire. They're just there as props. And then if you're going to be doing stunts, they'll typically have a weapon that's made of rubber. And it's, yeah. it's a hard enough rubber that it's, it's not going to droop or anything like that. But if, if a stuntman takes a fall with it, they don't want him, you know, banging his face up on, on the weapon. So sure. yeah. our, our friend, uh, uh, Ryan from an early, uh, early episode is, uh, who makes the breakaway props. He also makes a lot right. of rubber rifles these days. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's part of his business. Now, is there a, you've done extra work, you know, you've talked about a little bit, uh, is there a sort of a hierarchy? Is it cooler to be the guy who's shooting the gun that's actually firing versus holding the mock-up? I, I, I think it's, I, I, de- it depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, for me, you know, the chance to fire a Thompson, was, yes. <laughs> sign me up, you know, um, I think some of the guys just didn't care to them. It was just a job. Sure. I was, you know, being, being a historian and being someone who's fascinated with the movie anyway, to me, it was just, it was just kind of cool. Yeah. (laughs) So I, I, and, and, and the armor, I think I vaguely knew the armor from different movies and they figure out who they can trust. I mean, if you're former military, they know that you're not going to do anything stupid with it. So you, you move up to the top of their list for uh, for being somebody they can they can hand a weapon and and turn their back on so that they don't not turn their back in the sense that they're uh, for foregoing uh, set safety but they're not looking over your shoulder all the time like they would be with others. Yeah, it, and the the Thermocalon guys uh, they seem to mostly have rubber guns because they're all getting getting dropped by Paul Sorvino as there's a lot yeah, of, there's a lot of a flying, good shot, isn't he? Yeah, <laughs> flying firearms everywhere. <laughs> yeah, all the stunt guys have weapons that can be thrown. So unless there's a close up on them, in which case then they'll give them one of the I mean it depends on what has to be in the scene. If he's firing in the scene and he gets shot, then he's gonna have a practical weapon, but obviously, you know, you hope for the best and hope it doesn't get, you know, dented or bent or anything like that. Uh, uh one thing that I had heard at this particular minute, and I guess if you were there on all the nights you probably heard about this the fellow that is the stunt guy for uh the rocketeer as he gets as he goes blasting across yes the grass lawn he was severely injured is that yeah, right absolutely absolutely they shut the set down that night wow, wow. and it, he was just like they didn't realize that he was coming to the end of the the hill there or did you do you know any details of it I- you know it was a long time ago i mean at the time i knew he he went over the edge i think he was going faster than they thought and they hadn't cleared the path down far enough oh okay. i mean don't quote me on any of that no that, yeah, it, that sounds- it, it kind of got away from them and yeah. he hit his head yeah wow. like, so you know because he, he was on a cable yeah and the and the you know and i think the cable if i remember correctly the cable went around a pulley uh, oh that's what yeah that's what happened he was uh, he was on this he was in a, a a harness yeah the harness is attached to the cable the cable's going around the pulley and and it's attached to a truck so they're basically the truck is pulling him across the ground um the truck is not on camera because it's it's offset you know that basically at a 45 degree angle right. from the pulley and he was going too fast and, and hit the thing that was holding the pulley oh wow yeah so not not a good night I mean, and, and it's certainly, I mean, I didn't know the guy, but I mean, it, it, it has a devastating effect on morale on the set. Oh, I'm sure. And then they have to, you know, obviously they have to do an accident investigation. So they, they just, you know, after about an hour after it happened, they shut the set down and that was it. And we came back, I think it was the next night or maybe that was Friday night and we came back on Monday, but it was, it was, um, that was, we, we were done for that day. Yeah. Talking last week, uh, we had talked with Dr. Ed Krupp who run, who runs Griffith Observatory He's the director oh. there. And he said that this was one of the most complicated shots of any, uh, of anything they'd ever filmed at Griffith Observatory that usually they'll take like a night or to but actually right. shutting the place down for an entire week was almost unprecedented well that's i mean everything was at night because obviously they're not gonna you know un- un- unless they had a really good reason to they were going to shut the park down during the day yeah and uh, i mean it, when you try to imagine all the all the different entrances to griffith park because it's not just through the uh you know the toontown tunnel there you can go you can come in from over yeah. the top you can come any there's a million trails and stuff just trying to keep the security of this set must have been incredible. And when they brought Jennifer Connelly in by Zeppelin, I mean, that was the craziest <laughs> yeah, thing I ever much, saw. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> I mean, she was worth it. Don't get me yeah, wrong. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> come on. <It's- laughs> that is such a neat shot. So it's, you know, it's it's really well done looking up at the observatory and seeing the, the Zeppelin just, just coming yeah. over. You get a little bit of a sense for... 
you know, it's obviously a nice uh, composite shot with a model, but you get a little bit of a sense for how big these things were. This uh, the Luxembourg was fictitious. I know we've talked about yeah. this a little bit, but uh, would be it's it's numbered as the LZ one thirty, which was actually yeah. the Graf Zeppelin two. Right. So you're looking at something here. It's about uh, a little over eight hundred feet long, a little bit shorter yeah. than the Titanic, and it's just floating right over your head. Yeah, I, and I I liked the way Joe Johnson shot it because I think he did a good job of selling. Like everybody stops and looks up. Right. Everybody's yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't care that we're, average, we're in the middle event. of a, yeah, yeah. yeah, we're in the middle of a standoff here. Everybody yeah. is going to look up at, right. at at the sky that has just changed so dramatically, so drastically. It's just now blotted out by, uh, right. by you know, yeah. doped so, canvas. Yes. <laughs> The thing that I always wonder about, you know, a, a little bit of Deus Ex Machina there with the stormtroopers showing up out of the woods and get, you know, and getting everybody in uh, in place. Yeah, were they on the Luxembourg or did they come in through a different route? I was just trying, you know, it's like it doesn't seem. I mean, I mean, cer- certainly they could have come in on the Luxembourg. I mean, how, uh, you know, it, it's not clear in the script. I mean, the yeah. Luxembourg would have carried that many yeah, soldiers, right. yeah, you know, yeah, easily. Yeah. You know, how they would have gotten off of it with a, you know, did they rappel down? Did they, you know? I've always imagined them rappelling down and then getting into position, and you know, the the airship not, you know, it's it's dropped them off a little while ago, and it's it's you know, it, it's I mean, not necessarily just hand- moving nonstop. And, and you know where, where where was it this whole time? You know, yeah, so. was it hiding behind the Hollywood Land sign? Yeah, right. or <laughs> yeah. Very quiet quietly. with a German accent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean it could you know on on a dark night it could sit off the coast. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. Yeah, but yeah. but it would certainly blot out the stars. The costuming in this is fantastic, and from what Hal's been saying previously, the uh, the German uniforms are, are pretty accurate. Yeah. That's certainly my sense. Yeah, it's. And I was, I was thinking, it was it was a cold night in November in L.A., so these people were uh, probably very happy to wear these kind of costumes. Um, yeah, nobody was minding being bundled up. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I in, in the in the picture I sent you, I'm I'm wearing, you know, the the, the traditional G-man suit. Yeah. But I also had the overcoat that I wore in the, in the shots, and I was I was glad to have it. Yeah, yeah, and great fedora too. I'm really <laughs> sure your fedora was perfect. I now when. How did this go? Like, when did you show up? Was it like three in the afternoon? And, and I mean, I can imagine that the costume and getting just getting everybody into wardrobe must have been. Yeah, it's it's an process. adventure. I mean, the, particularly the first day. I mean, once they get everybody kind of sorted out. I mean, the, the whole process would be you would be cast in the project by central casting, and then you would come in for a fitting. So I was fitted for the suit on a separate day. So basically, when I got to the set, it was just a matter of handing me my my suit and then pointing me to a trailer or whatever it was they were going to have you change and then you got changed and then you stood around but it is yeah it's a lengthy process in the sense that there's a lot of people if it was just a couple of guys it wouldn't take much time at all but i mean everything in the movie is is um it's like being in the army it's hurry up and wait you know <laughs> you, you know you the, the the only person who shouldn't be waiting for anybody is the director <laughs> so it's just Everybody get ready, and then we're ready to go. We go. Oh. So you, you, everybody got the the extras were ready long before the actors were ready. Sure. And then you know you'd rehearse. Basically, what they did is they did a walk in on any film. You do a walkthrough of, of an action scene like that. So before the actors are even in costume, before they're in makeup, you kind of do this walkthrough with everybody and all the departments. You know, with the director, and it's basically here's how we're going to shoot these this scene and then they send you know the actors off to go get ready and they have stand-ins take their place and you basically walk through it again and walk through it again and everybody figures out you start setting the lights and everything's done and then finally the actors come back and then you walk through it with the actors in real real time real speed and then then you shoot how uh how late do you, were you running at night were you going like four in the morning or we were going all night we were going until the, the sun was coming up wow. it was i mean there it were it two things one was light which yeah. in November, you know, the sun wasn't up that early. But you also had to get out of the way because they didn't shut the observatory down while we were there. So we had to get all of our stuff out of the way so that they could open the observatory. In the oh, okay. And then so they were they were they were running it at night, but you had the, like your the trucks were all backed up, ready to roll at the minute the, the minute they locked the doors. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they they, they left some uh, equipment prepositioned up there just because it would have been too much, to, you know. And and they made whatever deal they made with the observatory to do that. But I mean, they definitely d- did not shut the observatory observatory down in order to facilitate shooting one of the things that we learned is that they pretty much if you watch a movie that was shot at the observatory it's a monday because that's when that's when they're closed so they, <laughs> they try to get everything everything rammed in on monday or sunday <laughs> yeah. night and monday it, it's amazing how many of these 
pickup shots. How how many times did you, like for your particular scenes? How many times did you have to go through? Did you like three days, four days, or you know, I I don't know. I remember being there a week. I mean, I was there all week, so I think we shot five days. We weren't shooting anything more than we had to, but. There were a lot of moving parts in the shots that we were doing. And yeah. it's certainly like the, the scenes with the Zeppelin required, you know, I mean, you're, you're working with something that's off screen. So now you're trying to make sure everybody's eye line is the same. You know, yeah, those, so, those so, scenes. Somebody's, everybody's... Holding, somebody's holding like a ball on a stick. And yeah, saying, watch exactly. this. Yeah, look yeah. at the neat Zeppelin. <laughs> look at the Zeppelin. <laughs> Come on, um, kids. Here, boy, here, boy. Here's the Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> It works for me. Um, yeah. Now, you you were doing advising work with with while you were doing the acting work. You were showing other people how to how to handle their their uh, firearms. Is that how how it generally worked? Or well, when you know, late I didn't do anything on the Rocketeer oh. other than like you know the guy to my left and right going, yeah, not yeah. this, do this. But le- later, I ended up what what basically happened is based on my experience on the Rocketeer and China Beach and tour of duty. You would go on a I was in the Army Reserve or the National Guard at the time, and you'd go on a set, and I would probably on the sex had a really short haircut. And so they would send me to a tour of duty and they'd say, okay, I want you to salute this guy as you walk by. And you'd say, okay, and you salute the guy. And then they'd turn to some other guy and say, you know, you salute too. And you go, okay, how do you do that? And then there'd be this, you know, have to find somebody who did know how to salute or they try and teach a guy to salute in 30 seconds. And unless you can yell at him, it's not going to happen. So it's <laughs> <Yeah>. just... <laughs> It's, you know, they would, and, and, and so that is what led me to put a bunch of guys together who were all veterans or reservists and started uh, renting our my, my crew out to different shows. So I basically kind of backed into the casting business without really intending to. <laughs> <laughs> and then because I was in the casting business, I would I would go to the set and I would wrangle all of my extras. I would, you know, and and half of them were guys who worked for me in the National Guard anyway. So it was you know e- easy enough to just say, OK, today we're going to make a movie. Yes, sir. Got it. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and they were all happy because they made more money working in Hollywood than they did the National Guard. So um, but but I would. But they still had to work. They still had to do two weeks. And- oh yeah, absolutely. So you know, but, but uh, you know, there, there's always a percentage of guys in the National Guard who are not employed full time. I mean, there's guys who are working, you know, a hundred hours a week and they have guard weekends. But other guys are only, you know, they're they're blue collar guys that go from job to job, and they were always happy when I had something going on because. You know, for them, it was a paycheck and, and a chance to do something cool. So they're all pretty excited about it. Hey, we're going to work in Lieutenant's movie. Um, <laughs> but but I, I basically, if, if what I found was that if you were the guy that brought the military guys and you were the, then you were the, the guy in charge of the military guys. And if they had questions and there wasn't a technical advisor, you became the guy they asked. Say how uh, Battlefield Commission. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. You get upgraded. <laughs> Say, how do you do this? Oh, OK. You know, and then all of a sudden you're, you know, you're you're talking with the crew and you're talking to the director and, and you're 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 sort of raised up out of the out of the uh, out of the masses. And that led to me. It actually led to my my experience with the group led to me being hired on Courage Under Fire, which was my first big job as a as being hired as a military advisor. And that was basically because they had a military advisor with the military. Well, they had they were expecting Department of Defense cooperation. Operation. They didn't get it. And they had hired a military advisor, but then the producer found out he was lying to him. Oh, they wow. fired him, and then the army deal fell through. And then they they basically, they asked for a recommendation, and the guy that I worked for, who was the actual army technical advisor, recommended me. So that's how I got oh. it. So you're saying that Tropic Thunder is more of a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I had worked on a show called uh, Executive Decision. Oh, yeah. And uh, the the military advisor was an army major named Tom McCollum. And my I brought 30 extras, all of whom were veterans. And the extras all looked better than the actors. So, oh. <laughs> so it, was, it was a little continuity problem because, uh, you know, they had these guys playing the, like the Joint Chiefs of Staff and all of them were fat and their hair was too long. It was, it was really kind of embarrassing. So. I don't know how many times I've watched a movie of my my time in uniform, other than a, a short stint in Air Force ROTC in college, but was was uh, in civilian law enforcement. But even still, uh, watching a movie and somebody salutes and their thumb is bent and they show their palm and their hair's too long, I'm the guy in front of the TV yelling at everybody. You know, it's just <laughs> this whole movie fell apart because his hair's touching his collar. <laughs> You know, that's ridiculous. I, I worked on a movie called The Puppet Masters, and I was in the National Guard at the time, and one of the actors didn't want to get his hair cut. He says, well, I'm in the National Guard. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you look like Joe Shiragman. So it's, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, you, you end up having some interesting conversations with people because they don't, uh, they don't really want to. I was always fascinated that someone would say, you know, I'm, I'm an actor and, you know, I'm really, I'm searching for this acting truth. Well, you know, your character would have a haircut. Oh, no, I, I, I need, I have other gigs coming up. Right. I can't. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm not searching yeah. for that much truth. <laughs> yes. I'm searching yeah. for the truth I can stand. I mean, I, I, I get yeah. a guy trying to make a living. I respect that. But, you know, if you're going to commit to a part, yeah. commit to the part. You know? yeah, Bill Murray didn't exactly go through boot camp and strike. <laughs> <laughs> Things you're like, wait a minute, Harold Wait, Lamas, now that that's wasn't not a documentary? A... <laughs> Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny guys in the military love that movie <laughs> love that movie. Uh, I, I, I not not telling stories out of, out of school but uh my uh, uh former co-host uh, M- uh mark yeah. Uh, worked on uh, worked on some stuff with HBO when they were showing Stripes, yeah. and uh, he interviewed PJ oh. Souls, and although and he actually <laughs> he has a photo of her. I, I'll see if I can get a copy of it. But he has a photo of taking with her where he's giving her the Aunt Jemima treatment. Jeez, <laughs> well, really? He, he was like, "That was one of the greatest moments of my life." Oh my <laughs> gosh, no kidding. Yeah, I said, yeah. "Wasn't that Sean Young?" He goes, "Hey, I I take what I can get." So it's like, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, and she stood out in that movie much more to me than uh, Sean Young did. Yeah, but I remember her from Rock and Roll High School. Ah, uh, and uh, oh, yeah. thought she was uh, she was terrific in that. I think her Halloween. But then again, Halloween anybody a... acting across, acting uh, in, you know across from Joey Ramone. I don't know who. <laughs> I don't know what kind of a challenge that is. The, the, I'll tell you the funny thing about Stripes. Not to get too far off in the woods. Too here, late. But, yeah. Um, yeah. But, but Stripes is actually. I, I I ended up talking to a guy who worked for the army for public affairs and this is back when i was doing courage under fire he says we would never do stripes today i was like why stripes is terrific and he says well you know it doesn't reflect army values I, and I, I just i'm like are you kidding i mean bill murray plays this goofball and yet everything he does in the movie reflects army values you know he does it his own way but when he has that you know man-to-man talk with sergeant hulk in the bathroom and gets punched out he actually listens to everything sergeant hulk says and when the team's in trouble he goes back he does it his own weird way but he goes back you know leave no man behind <laughs> he does everything he's supposed to do so you know why 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 would you not love that movie if in the army yeah it's it's good it's some someday somebody will do the stripes movie. actually worry you know that i think that that, that there's a calling yeah, there for you, you. Go. that would be fun well, the, do, the, best, do the, the stripes movie. i'd the, listen the best thing is they um not long before that they had done the movie in the army now with paulie shore which is yeah. a an awful movie b does nothing for army values right. and C, Pauly Shore, yeah. sure. Yes, it's C, um, Pauly Shore. <laughs> like, ah. um, so I just thought, okay, you, you would do his movie as stupid as that, but you wouldn't do Stripes. Got it. Well, um, actually, let, let's hold off uh, for today. We come back, we'll come back to the scene again tomorrow right. and, and, and chat a little bit more on, the, on, on these things. But with uh, folks who'd like to join our conversation on <laughs> the Rocketeer or Stripes, whatever other movie you happen to be watching at the moment, <laughs> ch- check back with us here on uh, our many social media. Find us on Twitter at Rocketeer Minute. Find us on Facebook. Uh, facebook.com slash rocketeer minute the great big website rocketeer minute.com where you can leave comments at the bottom of every single episode and we do read them trust me so uh, uh join us back here to- oh by the way also if you're if you haven't already please subscribe itunes or google play just go to uh itunes or google play type in the word rocketeer minute in the search bar and then click on subscribe and you'll get us hot and fresh every morning monday through friday so uh join us here tomorrow and we'll continue our, dis- our discussion as uh, there's a big blimp hanging in the air over Griffith Park. So we'll see you tomorrow here on the Rocketeer Minute. So until next time, over and out.